بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسول الله الكريم reason why i am looking at this nizam is what we will discuss regarding this is really a car guzari a trip that allah tbarak taala afforded us an opportunity to visit for a few days a very unique land which is known as the land of istanbul that we normally will know it as turkey the one part of turkey and in that land there was many many lessons that we took of present times of the past and we took lessons of the future and this is just to mention those lessons however in this nazam a few points were mentioned which had me thinking so we will explain the translation now and during the cause if allah tbaruk taala allows we will touch on those points he explains that try and take the surat ahl taqwa ki surat meaning try to make yourself look like the men of piety which is a very difficult thing but in south africa allah tbaruk taala has made it very easy in today's time to put on a kurta for a boy to put on the parda for a girl is nothing hard but you travel to the worlds which is known as muslim worlds in those lands you will find it's very hard so one thing we saw when we were in istanbul that as we walked with the kurta the people of turkey would always say you arab and they would give you a lot of respect so we say not arab we say no, you arab you they say you arab that man also at this time they have gone through that entire stage of what was called the modern age and now they coming out now when they coming out anyone they see in a garb which they regard as a garb of piety they respect that man that you are arab this is a unique garb and we have been given such ease in this country we will explain how it went through turkey and how they pulled this garb out of the people and now to bring them back onto it will take years but how they are now craving that we can somehow change our clothing we living in an environment where it's there enjoy it you have to go somewhere put it on it doesn't harm and then he says noor as sunnat se chehra saja lijiye and why don't you adorn even your face with the sunnah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam meaning how he looked from the top to the bottom how his mubarak hair was his mubarak beard was his mubarak mustache was bring it all on your body how his trouser was how his shirt was Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's every detail shirt means what we call nowadays a kurta there was some reason why a sahabi radhiyallahu an hasan radhiyallahu an would say to his uncle that i was young i cannot remember exactly how rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked some sahaba radhiyallahu an when he would ask them they would say that we accepted islam at a later stage so we would feel so shy that for so many years we had fought against rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam So when you had sat in his gathering, you would be too shy to look at him. So we just look down. So they would say, "I cannot really give you the full description because." And there were those who, right at the beginning, were with Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and even before Nubuwa. And some of them had such a mind that they were able to give detailed description of every part. They would explain how the nose was, the length of the nose, how it was bending, how it was long. They would explain the lips, the eyes. When you read that description, you will say. That even a computer could not explain it to such detail. How the lines would meet here, how the eyebrows would come. What love! Then they would explain the clothing. Then they would explain the character. That entire thing was called sunnah. The inside, the outside. So it says from head to toe. If you can bring on that nur of sunnah, and again in this discussion we will have of Istanbul, you will see what is the reason that you try to keep on to the garb of piety. What reason Nabi Sallam put so much of stress? that when my inside sunna is important my outside sunna is also important how i walk how i talk how i behave how i look everything because you will see when the enemy of islam made the attack normally we will say but it's nothing big this year but when the enemy of islam made the attack in istanbul which we will discuss this was the very part they hit on they hit on sunna and it was on sunna that they raped turkey of its islam they took it out that if you had to go after that to turkey you would never have thought this was once upon a time a great islamic land he says nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned when you have your mustache the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said my intercession will not be allowed for those people whose mustaches are too long now you'll wonder what that got to do with intercession it's not kufr but there was something that allah tbaruk taala did not like the sign of that mustache which ulama have mentioned that the hair of it goes over the lower lip over the lip once the hair of the mustache goes over the lip it was a disliked looked by almighty allah for whatever reason 
Today's science will explain that hay contains germs. And germs gather, then they hold on to hay. So as that hay comes here, this is the place where food goes through. This is the place where your tongue touches. So if that germ is always sitting here, then day and night you are always sucking in. So because of that dirt, they will explain. But whatever it is, it was a dislike look. Allah Taala never liked that the mustache should be so long that it now starts falling over here. And if you go in the world, you will see one trend that came up in the world when what we will call the kufr states brought themselves up. It was to keep that long mustaches. It would curl on one side. There was a reason that the look that was disliked the most by Almighty Allah was to become the most popular look for mankind. So he says, don't deprive yourself on intercession just because of a mustache. It says, when you're cutting your hair, then don't worry of this style and that style, and this player and that player, and this musician and that musician. When you are cutting your hair, then remember that the sunnah is either to cut all your hair, or to keep it at one length. But to cut it at one and to leave it at one, which got different names today. So the person will say, it's just my hair. There's no big issue in it. But remember, there is a big issue in it. It's a dislike look. Shaitan knows the look, which Quran mentions that Shaitan said, I will make men change their figure. Now there was something, what do you want to make them change their figure for? Because he knew Almighty Allah loves certain looks and does not like. So if the look is made of the look which Almighty Allah doesn't like, then during the day, you're not all the time in the masjid. But during the day, you all the time either looking how Allah Taala wants you to look, or you're not looking like that. If the wife dresses how the husband wants her to look, then he's happy with her all the time. And if she dresses how he doesn't want her to look, and even though he's not in the house all the time, as soon as he walks in, he looks at her, I told you don't wear this, and the fight starts. He sees her for one minute and a big fight. But when Allah Taala sees man at every second, Shaitan knew if I could just change his look, a lot will get done. He says, put on the right look. And he says, now come to the eye. That if that girl comes in front who you're not supposed to look at, you want to look. Then he says, why don't you move your eye? And you say, I sacrifice a little for my Allah. My Allah will give me a lot in return. Which normally we say, in this world, man is the slave. But when man dies, when you look at the description of Jannah, you will be able to say it seems as though in Jannah Almighty Allah will be saying to man that in the world you behaved like my slave. Whatever I wanted you did, even though it wasn't easy for you. Now today you're going to be the boss. Because in Jannah the description is like whatever man thinks of, whatever man asks, Almighty Allah will just be asking, what can I do for you? What can I do for you? So you did for me in the world, I'll do for you today. So when that girl comes in front, it's not easy. But the man who learned how to do it, does it. A lot of people say to take my eye away from a pretty face, a smiling face. It's very hard, nothing is hard. But it needs a lot of himmat and courage and a lot of help from Almighty Allah. And the day you get blessed with that, that when that girl comes in front, you can look down. When that picture comes on the internet, you can turn your eye. When the newspaper article comes in front, you just ignore it. Hazrat Mulana Yunus Patel Sahib Rahimullah would mention, that Allah Taala sometimes makes it so easy that the women of the world become like trees. So as you walk, you don't look at the tree, you see them. But no one looks at the tree and says, what a tree, what a tree. Just walk. Now you'll think impossible, but nothing is impossible. All it needs is to walk. To make that effort. And Allah Taala, when He sees man become sincere, then you see it. You look at a woman's face, what you see? It depends what you're looking at for. Why your wife is so pretty, but when you had a fight with her, you don't see the prettiness. At that time you swear. You don't say sweetheart, you don't say doll. You swear her mother, you swear her father. What happened to the beautiful skin? It's still there. But because now you're looking at something else, you don't see it beautiful anymore. Similarly, Quran taught man what to look at. But when that girl comes in front, when you had a fight for her, you're seeing the fight. Because of that, she never made the chicken, you sing the chicken not made. That's what you sing, that's why you fight. It makes you forget the beautiful skin on her body. Similarly, when man gets that scene of Jahannam in front, and he can picture that scene where Nabi Wasallam said, I saw a naked woman, fully naked, which makes man like get thrilled. I want to see a naked girl. 
said, I saw so many naked women and so many naked men, they were all together. And in that oven of Jahannam, they were going up as the fire was going up. And then they were coming down as the fire was coming down. Man and woman next to each other, each totally naked. But not one man daring or even thinking of touching the woman, each screaming in horror, burning. If that scene can come in your eye, and then when you look at that face, your eye falls, that same pretty skin, and you can see someone screaming in horror in Jahannam, you won't see any beauty anymore. And immediately you look away that, Oh Allah, save me from the fire of Jahannam. Oh Allah, save her from the fire of Jahannam. So what was the reason of visiting the city of Istanbul? And may Allah Taala make that we all go. We go to the Haramain. That is the first trip man must make. I had the chance, I sat by one person, so his son started saying to me, Allah Taala made it, now they finally went for Umrah. But I met him a couple of years ago, I went to one town, so he's sitting, we're having supper, so his son saying, I went to this country, I went to this country, I went, he gave me how many countries? His father's very wealthy. He counted out, he counted out, and he said, Aqsa, I have already been 15 times. So I was like, Mubarak. But I'm, I'm wondering, he's not mentioning Makkah, Mukarramah. Normally, you know, you go Aqsa, you have to go three harams. Aqsa, he went 15 times, and the boy is only about 20 years old. So how much? I think every I think, three times in the year, they'll make their journey. So I asked him, what about Makkah, Mukarramah? So he looked at his father like. So I never say anything. His father went away. I said, you never went to Makkah? He said, no. What's there? I said, the Kaaba is there. He said, yeah, but what's there like? I know the Kaaba is there. What's there? Why? Because every country you go, there's something to see. You got your brochure, you go visit here, you go visit here. Even if you go to Aqsa, they say, we'll go see this place, you go see that place. They say, what's in Makkah? So I told him that the Kaaba. He said, yeah, but what else? Yes. So then I told him, the day you go, you will understand what is in Makkah, Mukarramah. So I told him, when your father is taking you next time for a holiday, you tell him, I want to go to Makkah. And Allah Tawarukhtala made it that recently I went there, I heard, I asked where he said, gone for Umrah. After how many years, but... When I got the news, I said, that father for about 25, 30 years, from the time he became wealthy, he never visited Makkah, Mukarramah. Never. Now his son finally took him. Then you understand that the call is only a divine call. Allah says, don't come, you don't go. That is the first land and it has its own history. But what we coming to a land of Islam, in the past it was known as Constantinople. It was named after a great shaitani king whose name was Constantine, which you would have learned about in school. This Constantine was a satanist, he was a fire worshipper. He's what we call today Illuminati, Freemason, he was of that time. He and his mother were like the highest league. And then, when the world was being introduced to the religion of Nabi Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, and that Christianity was spreading in the world, there were two ways to stop the spread of Christianity. And that same two efforts they made to stop the spread of Islam today. One was the effort of what was called the Jew against the Christian. That the Jew who was not accepting Nabi Isa alayhi salam, they were also working with shayateen, they were oppressing, they were opposing, they were harming, they were tormenting. But the whole world knows that how much you can do with punishment, you can do much more with love. And you have to see it. An Ustad who hits his child, he makes the child learn, but the child doesn't want to learn. Harder it is to teach with love, but the child then enjoys the learning. The results of love is always very fast afterwards. Because the person gives his life for you. Shaitan understood the same thing. So there was always two ways they would make the world go round. One was they would torment the world, like what we know in today's time, but what is called the superpowers of the world. They fall in this country, they fall in that country, they rape, they torture. What and what they try to break Islam. But they also, and they've always known that with punishment you don't get much. Because you always say it's resurfacing, it's boiling again. There will be gorilla war, they will make the attack. And then you get the second attack which is called a hidden attack. It is called a attack of hypocrisy, a munafik, that you put someone in place as a leader of the Muslims. And you put him high, and the people fall in love with him. And they say, what a leader, what a strong man, what a hero. And when everyone gives their love for him, then whatever he says, the whole population attacks, accepts. No one fights. And in love, you can make the whole world go wild. 
When Khomeini was brought about to start what is called an Iranian Shia revolution, at that time in Iran, the entire land was nothing but Sunni. The entire Iran was Sunni. But the Hadith had mentioned that before the end of times, the world of Iraq, Iraq in the words of Sunnah means Iraq and Iran. That entire land was once upon a time the Persian Empire. It was called Iraq. The Hadith had mentioned at the end of times, the land of Iraq will go to the people of evil. So you will always think it's full of the people of Sunnah. Who will ever manage to take away this land? Iran and Iraq and how huge, full of the people of Sunnah. And what amount of knowledge came from those lands? Up till today the people benefit from the scholars that came from those lands. The entire Hanafi mother came from the land of Iraq. What what scholars came? But in love they took it away. Khomeini came. He created a revolution. He stood up against America. He stood up against the forces. And suddenly the whole Iran was in love with him. Everyone was in love. The Sunni were in love. The only Sunni at that time. But when love was created, in a few years he was able to destroy the entire religion of the people. Finished. Those that opposed, they were singled out. They were targeted. A lot of people think there's no Sunnis in Iran. There are a lot of Sunnis still. You can't change everyone. But they are so oppressed that they have no voice. We have chance. We get a chance to meet certain of them. We ask them, how's the conditions? They explain, our own children now got no madrasas. In our, we have to send our children to their madrasa, government madrasa. In the government madrasa, he makes the child say, Muawiyah, the enemy of Islam, said, and the boy has to say it. It's put in the mind. Every young child must repeat, repeat. He says, but still, we are still there. <coughs> so Khomeini came. Love. At that time, Constantine was a great Persian king. And the shaitani world told him to destroy Christianity, we'll do it from within. So what he was told to do is suddenly convert to Christianity. It was going to be the first king. Example, if we have to say today, the king of England accepted Islam. Everyone will be like wild. But the king of England got no power. At that time, the kings had power. His every statement was rule. It was the first king that was accepting Christianity. The Christians were thrilled. Persecution is over. They were all happy. And it was the first entrance of the European into the world of Christianity. He and his mother entered Halina. And slowly and slowly, Paul was in the time of Nabi Isa Islam just after. He had written all his filth. But Paul needed Constantine to spread it in the entire world. Constantine would come years later. And he would take the religion of Paul as the religion of Isa Islam. Whoever would oppose now was opposing the mighty European Empire, the Roman Empire. So no one could oppose it. And today's Christianity was Constantine's Christianity. He was a Satanist of the highest order. This Constantine, as every leader wanted to build something, he built what is known as Constantinople. He made it his city. His city, his empire, his class. And in Constantinople, the castle that he was going to put up, for the world to remember him was what we today call the Haga Sophia, Aya Sophia. And you can see what a Satanist he was. How he hated the men of Allah. That when he put it up, he died just before its completion. So the next emperor that came after, in a very short while, hardly anything was left, he put it up. When he finished, so when you will go to Istanbul, you will see, they will explain this and you will wonder why. But this is how Satanists hate the men of Allah. When it was completed, and then they had all the thousands and millions gathering around, how many thousands you have. And then he said a statement. He said, Solomon, Solomon means Nabi Sulaiman a.s. Because Nabi Sulaiman a.s., the Jews, Satanists always hated him. They would call him a magician, they would call him an evil man, they would call him a man just who in love with women. Because he was a man who brought the jinn down, who had them under. He was a man who put up a rule over the shayateen. And in the understanding of many, he was the one who had the jar locked up and chained. So Suleiman al-Islam was always the worst. So this man said, Solomon, you think you put up Aqsa? In my words, he said, this is my words. His words were, Solomon, we beat you. What he meant is that Nabi Suleiman al-Islam put up the mighty masjid of Aqsa. 
with the aid of the jinnat. It was unmatched in history, Sulaiman Alayhi Masjid. This Constantine, he put up the Haga Sophia to show that we can do better. So he said, Solomon, we beat you. And we will explain about this point. Did they really beat Nabi Sulaiman Alayhi Salaam? So Constantinople was there. It was put up in such a unique manner that it became the center of the Christian world. Because it had the wealth, the power, the prestige, it would be the choice for any army. That let's take over this land, let's loot it, let's take the wealth. But for 1,000 years it stood. And only one army ever managed to get in. And that was because people who were in opened up the doors. It was an inner issue. Otherwise, without help from within, for 1,000 years, whichever army came was defeated. And entirely defeated. So why was it such an impregnable fort? So when you will go there, they explained they had had about nine qualities. Whichever ones I can remember, I will mention. But you will have to see this land to understand it. The first is, on three sides, it's surrounded by water. On the one side, it has what they call the Mamara, that is the ocean. On the one side, it has the Bosphorus. Then you have what is called the Golden Horn. So the Mamara and the Bosphorus, the water, the current is very hard. So if any ships would come, the current would never allow them to put anchor. So they would be more moving in the water than staying, so you could not launch an attack from the ships. There was this one place what is called the Golden Horn. The Golden Horn because here you have this Istanbul, and here you got another land. So it's water between two lands. So there's not so much of current. So if you enter this area, which is called, it's like a horn shape, so they call it golden horn. Because when the sun hits on it, that's color that it gives. So if you manage to enter and you can go to the north, from there it's the only place from sea that you can launch an attack. But the problem is that the entrance wasn't very big. So all the enemy had to do is, they had to lay out un, in the water chains. So if any ship comes, you're hitting on the chain. You can't go through. So you will need someone to get into the water and start cutting or trying to remove the chains. And on the other side of the chains, they had the mightiest fleet. Huge, huge ships. So whoever would come, then they would start throwing the catapults. Fire would go, arrows would go. So to get into the golden horn was impossible. So there was three places surrounded by water you couldn't get. There is now the west. So whoever launched an attack for 1,000 years would come from the west. In the west, if the people could get to the fort, something could start happening. 1.5 kilometers away from what is called the castle, the beginning of the city, they had walls. They call it Theodosian walls. So if that man would manage to somehow scale those walls, and it's not an easy thing to scale high walls, especially in that era. There was no aeroplanes, there was no helicopters. After falling from that wall, 1,000 1.5 kilometers away is the city, but those people are already shooting catapults. Fire is going, rocks are going, everything is going. As you land on the other side of the wall, there is a moat. What we call it's dug in, it's filled with water. That moat on one side is 20 meters wide, and it was 7 meters deep. So you somehow manage to get in. Either you're swimming, if it has water, or if it's empty, then you have to climb. Again here you are being hit with arrows. You are being hit with fireballs. You are being hit with rocks. So which man is ready to sacrifice his life to take a chance there? If you manage to get out of that, now you will run towards what is called the castle. At the castle you will find two walls. And every 75 meters is a tower where you have soldiers who are shooting at you. And you must understand the system of shooting arrows. It's not like how we thought I learned bow and arrow shooting, so one arrow flies. In the past when they would make war... It was a system where the army, you can picture 5,000, you can picture 10,000, picture 20,000. And sometimes you would have a line of 50,000 soldiers. They are told, ready, everyone will pull his arrow. Then they would say, shoot. On that sen sentence, shoot, you would have 50,000 arrows flying at the same time. You can understand, it's not one arrow. The chance of missing is hardly... Enemy obviously would be covered completely. Arrows are hitting. Fire is coming on top. So they put their shields. They are firing. And they say, shoot again. Another 50,000 arrows. 
this side they shoot, that side they shoot. The whole sky is filled with arrows. So that man who is trying to climb that wall now, he can understand how many arrows is coming because he got no support from behind. The first wall is 9 meters, the second wall is 12 meters. You have to get past another two walls. If you manage to get in, now you landed, but you're all alone. Because the army is still outside. How you are going to manage to fight? So very hard. The only way to break the people of Constantinople was to lay a siege. That we don't attack. We just surround the city. And after a while you have to get tired. You can't come out. You have to give up. But Constantinople could last sieges for five years. And in five years they had the support of the entire Christian world. So once the news would come and enemy has landed, the ships would start being sent from all over Europe. So they would be coming. So that enemy knows, I've got a little while to get finished, I have to go. So you lay your siege, but you're laying, nothing's happening. Why nothing is happening? They had farms in Constantinople. So much of food they had that could last through the sieges for years. So what else they needed? They needed water. So water was coming from out. But if the enemy managed to cut the water supply up till today, you will go, they will show you there's something called a cistern. It's like a huge tower which would gather water during the water season. And it would be so cold underground that it becomes ice. So it's nothing but ice. Thousands and thousands and thousands of liters of ice. And if ever a siege had to be laid, then from the cistern they would start melting the ice. And that water would last them for years and years. An underground system of water. The only one issue is how do your dirt go out? You are going to go toilet, you are going to have stool, you are going to have dirt. So they had the outlets going into the ocean. So there was no need for worrying of dirt. You put it there, no enemy can close those outlets going into the ocean. It was a unique system. Years and years, 1,000 years they managed. Whichever enemy came, they lost so many soldiers that they said, we're not coming again. And like that it carried on. Now Islam comes. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sitting with sahaba radiallahu anhum. He says, do you all know of that one land which is by water? That word by water, everyone knew it was the land of Constantinople. They all knew it. It was a land surrounded by water. What a land. So it was a time where Islam was just rising. Already Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had told them, you will take the Persian Empire. That left them shocked. He told them, you will take the Roman Empire. That left them shocked. He told them, the land of Constantinople, لَتَفْتَحُنَّ الْقُسْتَنْتِنِيَ He said, I'm telling you, you will take that land. One thousand years, no army ever took it. He said, you will take it. وَلَنِعْمَ الْأَمِيرُ أَمِيرُهَا He said, what a wonderful Amir that will be. وَلَنِعْمَ الْجَيْشُ ذَلِكَ الْجَيْشُ And what a wonderful army. Now you will understand the value of this word. Look how short that word is. It was three sentences. You will definitely take Constantinople. One sentence. Second, how wonderful Amir. Third sentence, what a wonderful army. Finished. When we went to Istanbul, we understood the value of these three sentences. And you will understand the power of Nubuwa. The person who wrote the article, he wrote a unique article. He said, what made the Muslim Ummah give their lives to get this land? Where for 1,000 years, whichever army came, lost so many soldiers that they said, we'll never try it again. They lost courage and another army had to come. But the Muslim Ummah, what kept them again and again, again and again trying? So he says, it was yaqeen on the words of Rasulullah wasallam. That when the Messenger of Allah said it's going to happen, it had to one day happen. So if it doesn't happen, we'll try again. Doesn't happen, we'll try again. Doesn't happen, we'll try again. And he says, the second is, that every soldier and every Amir that came in Islam, he had that hope that if it could be me that Rasulullah s.a.w. spoke about, when he said, what a wonderful Amir. So every Khalifa who came, a muhaddis would come to him, and he would say, narrate to me the hadith of Constantinople. And when he would say, وَلَنِعْمَ الْأَمِيرُ أَمِيرُهَا And the Amir would cry and he would say, get the armies ready. How do you get the army ready? He would say to the army, وَلَنِعْمَ الْجَيْشُ ذَلِكَ الْجَيْشُ What a wonderful army that will be. An army will get ready. Hazrat Muawiyah radiallahu in the 58th year after Hijri, the army is ready. They are masters of the water. 
the army goes out. Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam already indicated the first army won't get it. So he said, the first army that will attack Constantinople, مَغْفُورُ lahum, That Allah has forgiven all their sins. And why he said it, it was going to be such a loss for the Muslim ummah in that battle, that if they had to come back, they would have been so sad that we never saw such losses, that they would have said it wasn't worth it. But when they came back defeated, every one of them smiled, that my Nabi told مَغْفُورُ lahum that you are forgiven. Why it was the biggest loss? They say during the time when Sham was being conquered, some evil person, it could have been shaitan, it could have been a secret agent of shaitan. Someone reached the land of Constantinople, up till today no one knows who. And he told them, I'm giving you all an ingredient. You use this ingredient to keep away whatever force try to take over this land. Up till today they call it Greek fire. Whether it still exists, most likely it finished that ingredient. What was Greek fire? It was the only ingredient in that era which when made, it would create fire. And the fire would move through the waters. In water it would burn. The world had never seen something. And they write there, in Istanbul it's written, the ingredient of this is still a secret. Nobody knows how it's made. They had it and they used it. So when the Muslim army came in the era of Muawiyah radiallahu anh, his son was in charge of the army attacking from land. Somebody else was in charge of the army by ship. They reached the golden horn. They're fighting with the enemy on the other side. Arrows are flying, arrows are flying. Suddenly, Greek fire goes through the waters. Fire is going, which nobody knew that fire can burn underwater. Suddenly, someone is screaming, the boats are on fire. When your boat is on fire and you are deep in the ocean, you can understand how many deaths occurred. So many that finally Muawiyah said, come back. Bring the armies back. As the army is returning, the enemy launched a double attack. Enemy from outside had come. They surrounded the retreating army. The retreating army was sunk also. So many casualties that when they returned, you would have expected everyone crying. But that one hadith kept everyone's spirits alive. First army, Allah has forgiven all your sins. He said, my father was in that army. My father was in that army. But the desire to be, wala ni'mal amiru. How mubarak that amir will be. So times come, go. The next khalifa that comes, this was the 58th year of Hijri, Muawiyah radiallahu anh tries it. Thereafter the Muslim ummah had fights for a while. When things now became stable again, the Khalifa is finding that things are stable in the Muslim world. A muhaddis comes in front, he says, narrate to me the hadith of Constantinople. He narrates it, he says, get the army ready. 40 years later, 98th year of Hijri, another army will go out. Another army, an effort is made again. During that time, many other battles. In the 165th year, Harun al-Rashid sends his army. They also, they were on the verge of taking it. They were making inroads. The enemy understood Constantinople is going. So they send a message to Harun al-Rashid, let's make a truce. That we stay on our lands, you stay on your lands. Islam spreads in that side, the Christian world. The Muslims and the Christians made a truce at that time and it lasted for years and years. So Constantinople now has kept one side. Until then came the Ottoman Empire, which when we were born or we grew up, it was like the end of the Khilafat. For the newer generation, we never even saw the Khilafat. The older at least knew there was something. Go to Istanbul for this purpose. That I'll visit that top copy and I'll just see certain things and understand what it was when the Muslim had a Khilafat. What a power they were. One rule, the whole Muslim world, everyone listening. It's something. Because we never saw it. To have the whole Muslim world on one command... When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Khilafa, and it's something about a Khilafa, and to make dua, that may Allah Tawarukullah restore it. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about, he said a time will come when my Khilafa will be destroyed. The Sahaba got shocked. No Khilafa. How will Islam run? Because all the kitabs, when you study in Madrasa, whatever you do, it can only be applied if you got a Muslim government ruling. Otherwise you can't get it. But you can't understand. Sahaba was shocked. So then Nabi Islam kept quiet. The Sahabi said, then what? Meaning if the Khilafat is destroyed, that's when Turkey came. If the Khilafat is destroyed, it means Islam is destroyed. So Nabi Islam said, Allah will make it stand again. Meaning the Khilafat will destroy, but Islam won't die. Islam will wait, 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 wait. 
And it means it will stand in the hands of Hazrat Al-Mahdi. It will just stand. And the way he said it will stand, meaning the whole world will make an effort, it mustn't stand, it will stand one day. But at that time you had the Ottoman Empire. In the Ottoman Empire the effort started again. And they also came close. A time came where one of the Khalifas or one of the Amirs, the Sultans of the Ottoman Empire understood that the enemy, whenever we sieging, laying siege on this land, they're sending boats from Europe. So when the time the boat's coming, we have to go. So we will put up forts on the lands we own. So when those ships come through from the forts, we will start shooting at those ships. So he put up one fort. And he was known, he had a title, they call him Lightning. Because he was a master warrior. And he was fighting, fighting, and he almost also got Constantinople. But when the enemy realized the Shias in his own land, they started fighting there. So he had to go back. And that's always been a part of Islamic history. That whenever the people of Sunnah were on the verge of conquering, the enemy through what was known as the Shia would always stab in the back. And the Muslim army had to go. So when he went back, he passed away. He was taken as captive and he passed away in prison by that army that had laid an attack. So now the next sultan comes. The next sultan, as he's ruling, he has a son. now. That boy's name is Muhammad. Muhammad is put into the tutelage, into the khidmat, into the growing up of a great sheikh of that era who was known as Aq Shamsuddin. And Allah Tabarukullah blessed this man with such a nazar that it's written in the books that at that young age of about five or six, he already told us Muhammad that I don't know why, but I just feel you are the boy mentioned in that hadith. Now what did he see in Muhammad? This is 800 years after the sentence is uttered by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He looks at this boy and he says, you're going to be that boy. So Muhammad in his dreams, he's seeing Constantinople. At the age of 12, his father for some reason says, I'm retiring. I don't want to be the sultan anymore. You be the sultan. And a 12 year old boy is put on a seat. And everyone is shocked. But he rules the country for two years. As a young boy, they even have his book, what drawing is to do in the maktab. Like when you have a child, he goes to a maktab and he's playing around, the ustad is teaching, but he's doing some drawing. They got his drawings. In his drawings, he was drawing armies. Combat. Preparing how the battle is going to be. So they say his mind at that time was already war. How is it going to happen? He's going to start and train him. You're going to be that boy. Age of 12, he's the sultan of the Muslim world. Two years. But because of his young age, people who were in started making an issue. So he understands that there's going to be a rebellion in this community. Because I'm young. So he writes a letter to his father. And look at his mind. And they have the letters there also in that language. He writes a letter to his father. He says, oh my beloved father, from his son to his father. I beg you with respect, please come and take your job back. Meaning you are sitting and relaxing in retirement, I am suffering here. Please come and take your job back. And then he writes the next line, and if you are not ready to accede or to listen to my request, then from the leader of the Muslims to one who is under the leader, I command you to come and sit in my place. So he said, his request from a son to the father, and if you don't want to listen, is the Amir to the man under the Amir. You come back. Father came back. And then till the age of 20, the father ruled. But he had two years to rule at the age of 12. What he saw, at the age of 20, his father passes away. Now again he comes. The person says, whenever we sat with Sultan Muhammad, the only thing that he had to bring up in any discussion was Constantinople. Always something, what's happening there, what's happening there. And thereafter he says to his Ustad, his Sheikh, that I think we have to go for this. But how do we get the Muslim world to join us? At that time he wasn't the Khalifa. The Khilafat was still what was in Iraq. It was the Abbasi Khilafat. But he had pulled a lot of the Muslim army, so he was taken by the name of Sultan Muhammad. He said, how do we get the Muslim world? Because I'm not the Khalifa. You make a call, who's going to listen? So the Mufti and the Sheikh are given the job. You will write an invitation to the different Muslim countries. That Sultan Muhammad is going out. Whoever wants to come for this battle, go. How do you give dawah towards such a thing? A battle that whoever tried so far was defeated. And now he's not taking his soldiers. He's asking for help for many others who are not his soldiers. Again, it comes to the one hadith of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That was all. 
They put that hadith in. You are definitely going to conquer this land. Mubarak Amir, Mubarak Ami. As it went to the lands, which which leader could look at it and say, no, I'm not going. 265,000 soldiers move with him. And he says, let's go. And he has prepared from what age? So much of effort. Whatever mistakes were made in the past, everything in his mind, his whole strategy is laid out. We're going to go here. The one fort was already put up. He put up another fort. Enemy ships are going to come. We will rain down on the enemy ships. Help will not come. You will attack from there. You will attack from here. This is the weak spot. How much of years of planning? And then he had a certain cannon, which was a unique cannon of that time. They say he started the era of gunpowder. The cannons were already being used by the armies. But then a certain cannon was made where his own Muslim advisors told him this cannon will not work. It is too big. And the size of the ball that's going to flow, come out of it, it will not manage that power. And he asked the engineer, the engineer was a non-Muslim, but he had got him on his, because of paying him so much of money to create that thing, this man made it. And he asked the man, what do you think it will work? He said it will work, and the advisor said it won't work, and all were right in the ending. All were right in this manner, and what the thing of history. When you go there, you can visit this place which is known as the, I can't remember the name now, if it comes I'll mention to you, there the cannon is there still, the cannon. That cannon did its job. It shot one, and it shot two. On the second shot or the third shot, the whole cannon burst. But the two shots that it hit, it made that weakness which later on was the one place they broke through finally. So when the advisor said it will work, it worked. He was a non-Muslim, and when it burst, he was the one standing next to it. So he died. And the advisors were also right. They said it won't work, and it never worked. It blew but the two shots was going to change the course of history. Two shots. He had that ready. He had how many cannons, how many boats, what an army went, and how much of talk. And then when he landed, and it started the war, and all his dreams, and everything is being made, and what morale the Muslims got, and the hadith is being rang out, and they're fighting and fighting. But again, Constantinople was going to show, you can't take over me. Wherever the Muslims are going, they're getting pushed back again. They are there by the golden horn, but the plan doesn't go. Suddenly, Greek fire is being shot from under. They also know about it. They got the ways to protect. But it's not working. The enemy are hitting still. And then help is coming. Europe has already sent four ships. They got their forts ready to knock the ships out. The ships go through those forts. When the ships reach through, so many Muslims had died already. The whole Muslim army said, it never happened. It's not going to happen now, maybe in the future. His main wazir says, let's call it off. His army starts defecting. People are going away. There's a major mashwara. What to do? Help of the Europeans is coming already. How many ships are being sent? He's sitting. He said, his sheikh writes a letter to him. His sheikh is also part of the army, but you're not always with. You understand? You've got 265,000. You in that part. You in that part. A letter reaches the sultan. And again, like how he wrote to his father, the sheikh with the authority of a sheikh to his murid, and with the respect of a man to the sultan writes. He says, most respected sultan. So he started with respect. And then with the authority of a sheikh, he wrote very harsh words. The harsh words, they never translate the whole letter. But when you read it, you can understand how harsh it was. But the crux of the letter was that when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, one day an army is going to get the land, it has to happen. If it's not going to be you, it will be somebody else. Don't be a coward and give up. So he looks at that letter and then he starts crying. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, A time will come when my ummah will reach Constantinople. And they will find the waters are holding them back. That's what was happening. Then they will suddenly find the waters will dry up for them. And then they will go over land. And they will enter into. The whole ummah, whoever read this hadith, thought that maybe one day a miracle will come, the army will reach, the water will change, like how it changed for Musa alayhi salam. So they waited for that, waited for that one day it's going to happen. That night he's crying, he's crying. Allah Taala puts a thought in his mind. It's such a weird, absurd thought that he doesn't even tell his soldiers what I want to do. Because the wazir will laugh, ministers will laugh. He says, start cutting down trees. They are all cutting trees. They don't know why. Logs are being brought down. Timber is made. He says, lay it out, lay it out, lay it out. 
And then he calls his ministers and he says, you see the ships? He points 70 smaller ships. He says, if I take rollers, like wheels, rollers, they already had rollers to push houses so that they could get in the house and try and climb over the walls. He said, as our houses move on rollers, do you think a ship can move on rollers? So the man said, if it's flat ground, no problem. But where do you want to move it? He says, you see there where the chains are, closing the entrance to the golden horn. After that land is there. But that land is mountains. Three miles of mountains. He says, if we can manage to get our ships on those mountains, up, down, up, down, up, down, three miles, we'll pass all of this on that side, and then we'll enter the waters. So the minister will look and say, you, how many months it will take? Seventy ships. So I got one night. Let's do it. One night. Up till today they write that when the next European leader came to find out how did they take over Constantinople, he said a sentence that in the entire history of mankind, in military strategy, an example of this has never been seen. He wrote in it. Up till today, it was called a remarkable that has never been repeated. He had the logs laid. He had the timber. Then he had the rollers. Then he said, how are you going to get the ships to move over it? He had oxen and men to start pulling. Thousands of men on every one ship. Then he had grease laid out so it will slide. And then one Allahu Akbar and everyone pulls one. And the ship moves slowly. And then it moves slowly. And then it moves slowly. And as the first is going, the second one says, start moving. As it goes, Mufti Muhammad Taqi Usmani, he says, I heard it, I read it. I said, wow. He said, but when I went to that land which is the three miles of mountains, I also said, I can't believe it. You cannot take it, but he did it in one night. Enemy from far could see lights going up and down. You think there's some caravans moving. The next morning they found that the ships are coming down. And to come down also is not that the ship can go sliding. The same difficulty of going up is the difficulty of going down. Because now you got that same soldiers and oxen pulling it backwards. Because if it slides, the whole ship is gone. You say, Allahu Akbar, and you leave a little bit and it moves. Then you stop. Now you're holding it. Then you move. Then you stop. Then you move. And 70 ships land in the water. And then I thought that the war was finished. The war only started then. But it was the first time in Constantinople history that the people of Constantinople had to worry about that side. They had to worry about that side also. They had to divide. Now the thing started. Now the attacks are being made. Now the cannons are shooting. Now everything is happening. But again, the people of Constantinople. What morale. 1,000 years, we were never, they put up a statue. They say, Virgin Mary, when she overlooks the city, we will never be defeated. They are firing. The Muslims are attacking. This army tries. That army tries. And again, the time comes where the Muslims say, we're not getting through. Although we reached here, and help is on its way, it's on the brink. And then Sultan Muhammad, again his minister says that the leader of Constantinople says, let's make a truce. I'll allow you to go out unharmed. And he asks the people, what you say? Let's go, let's give up, let's give up, let's give up. And then he walks in his army, and amazing, he walks in his army. And as he walks in his army, he says, that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, what a Mubarak army will be the army who takes over. He says, oh my soldiers, I think you all are that army. They say, as he said that, they just started crying. So he says, tomorrow, who is ready to give their lives? That if a hole has to appear at any wall, then you don't give the enemy the chance to put up that wall, you go. But it means you know I'm going to die. Because whatever they shoot will hit me. And he said, like about a hundred soldiers came front. It's a tarikh, a history, which when you see it, you get shocked. That how that army then went the next day. And how they ran for those openings. And the enemy are shooting arrows. But here you got a man who's ready to take the arrows. One place you are in Istanbul. When you are in the tram, moving around in that bus and in the tram, they'll always tell you, stopping at Ulubati, Ulubati. So Ulubati Hassan was that man who told, I'll take the flag. And I will make sure it reaches where it has to reach. So when you go to this, what is called panorama, that's the word I was looking for. They have put it up where the conquest took place, panorama. At the panorama, they will have like a small, like, where you see one man with a flag there. And in his body, there must be about 50 to 60 arrows. 
They say this man took that flag and as the arrows hit him, hit him, he went to the top and he put it with all the arrows hitting him, no fear, and he died with that flag. And that flag stood. When that flag hit, the whole army screamed that the flag reached and everyone started going in. And then there was a unique tarikh after that, how they changed, how he entered, how the Europeans were so worried now, after so one month of effort, what they were going to do, and Sultan Muhammad came, as he entered with his people behind, everyone's head was down, and he made an announcement, he said, the bayan will be later on, the lecture will be later on, but I can tell you one thing, everyone's life has been spared, no one will be attacked. He said, people were crying, he gave that lecture, everyone was laughing, everyone was happy, so there's something to see when you go in that panorama, you feel like you're in that war. They have built it such, and you read what happened. So that was that tarikh. It took a while. Very fast, I will try and explain now what I wanted to bring the bayan to. Then came the time when Nabi Islam also mentioned, Islam reached its heights after that. What a height! Nabi Islam said, when it will reach its heights, Islam in Constantinople, you will see unique masajid being built. And if you visit, you take the chance to go see that unique masajid. One masjid I built was called the Sulaymaniya Masjid. So when I went there, there was one guide, so I was listening, overhearing. The guide was explaining what is the Sulaymaniya Masjid. So when I came back, I researched a little bit, and I understood that when Nabi Islam said, unique masajid, you will see it there. The Sulaymaniya Masjid was in the time of Sultan Sulaiman the Great. Before passing away, he called one minister of his, one general, one builder, his name was Zinan. And he told him, you see this Haga Sophia, it was a masjid. And I told him it was built by Constantine. And that man who built it after that, he said, we beat you, O Solomon. Although they never beat Suleiman, but how beautiful the Haga Sophia was. So he told Zinan, I want you to build a masjid on the same pattern of the Haga Sophia. You must match it. To match something that was built with so much of precision. So Zinan said, I won't do it. Because there's too many flaws in that thing. So the Sultan asked him, what flaws? And he pointed out the flaws. And he was instrumental in sorting out the flaws. Otherwise the thing was going to collapse. He did certain things which up till today they use in building structures. So the Sultan told him, I'm not interested in your stories of flaws. And then on the same pattern you will build it. And Zinan wasn't happy and the Sultan was a Sultan. He went away, he gave the job. Two years later he returns to see how much is done. Nothing is done. Because Zinan is not interested. So people start saying, Zinan took the money and he's gone. But Zinan wasn't gone, he wasn't interested. So, so, so Sultan comes, they have a slight argument. So Zinan says, if you want it, I'll put it up for you in two months. You're making like a big issue of it. So the Sultan says, I give you now two months. And everyone told him, they said, they said to the man, you are mad. You lost your mind. A thing which have taken years, two months, in two months he put it up. But he put it up on the same pattern of the Haga Sophia, and he did certain things which the eye can't pick up, which was going to avoid the flaws of the Haga Sophia. That where there there was a mistake, mine won't have the mistake. He did certain changes, which only when you dare you can see. But certain things we can understand of the masjid from here. When the masjid was built, the sultan came to congratulate him. So he asked, where is he? They say he's smoking hukka in the masjid. So he said, like a child he is. He came there, he saw him in the front, he was playing with bubbles. So he asked, what are you up to? He said, I'm testing the sound of my masjid. He had built in the wall certain air ducts that would pull in sound and send it. Because the child was with me in the back. As we were there, one child was running. So he made a ah. As he made the ah, there we heard the echo in the masjid. So you can understand, there was no mic systems. Then Zinan said, so many candles in this masjid, insects will come. So after every six candles, he had one ostrich shell. In the ostrich shell, a certain ether was put in which the insect can't stand. So because of that smell, which is a nice smell also, but no insect will come to these six. No insect. The entire masjid had no insects. Then he said, so many candles burn, burning over 200, 300 candles. How much of that, whatever you call it, will slowly, slowly fall. It will mess the masjid. So he built it in such a manner where the wind flow, it goes on that on the candle, something I could never understand, but they wrote it and it worked. It hits it at a certain angle. And it carries that suit, whatever they call it, to a certain ledge on the other side. That ledge would gather it, and they would have someone to gather that, and they would use it to make ink. What a thing. You wonder how it's flying. But the most amazing thing of Zinan's building, which I saw, they said in 1950, certain places of Zinan's masjid, Sulaymaniyah masjid, what is called a locking brick, 
they felt that it's coming out of place. So the locking brick must be holding up a certain section, so you had to do some repairs there. So people went up and they removed that and they saw some letter was written. But it was written in the old, how many years ago? 500 years ago language. So they stopped the construction to get someone to translate that. The translation was that salams to whoever is reading my message from Zinan to you. If you are reading this message, it means my locking brick has come out of place. Please don't do your own thing, follow my instructions. They said as they started in the masjid, wherever they found a problem, they found Zinan's letter. And they have used that letter to keep that thing in its exact position. What a man! But how the hadith said, what masjid they will put up? Azan will go down. So Azan can carry on, inshallah, we'll just, by inshallah, by half past, inshallah, we will stand for salah. The half past, we will stand for salah. Right? So then came the time which was the saddest time in Islam. It was the era of Mustafa Kamal. We mentioned that how they brought him into picture. The allied forces that attacked, the whole Muslim Khilafat was being destroyed. The people of Turkey thought my independence is going away. Suddenly Mustafa Kamal, he fights against the British. He fights the allied forces. He starts winning. So he becomes known as Atartuk, meaning the founder of Turkey, the saver of independence. They put him on the chair next to the Khalifa. After a while he's stronger than the Khalifa, all in love. The people of Turkey grew up in the love of this man. One man I met from Turkey, he said, to us Mustafa Kamal was like God. He said, it's only today we realize that he made us like monkeys. He said, we grew up in his love. How much we have the love of Rasulullah wasallam. The love of Mustafa Kamal was part of Turkey culture. In the park you go, you see Mustafa Kamal's statue like this. That the child must come and sit on it. But now times are changing, no child was now sitting. Now they understand this man was a shaitan. But in love, how he changed them. So very fast I will go through to take lesson of history. When he came into power, he got everyone's confidence. He changed certain things, which is no big things, which were very big things. The first thing he said, you must dress modern. And he had ulama to give the fatwa behind it. That there's no need of a sunnah dress. You dress modern because the world is modern. Your sattar is covered. You dress modern. So they passed a law to dress like the fanatics of the past. Meaning the old people who almost brought Turkey down is not permissible. So whoever had the kurta was now taken as a terrorist. So people had to remove the kurta. So it was modern dress. You took it out of the man, how you take it out of the woman? So how you take out a scarf from a woman and a trouser from a woman who never showed her legs to the world? To take out a scarf might be easier. To take out a trouser from a woman who got modesty. So he made a law that every young girl must go to school. And in school they said there has to be a uniform. In the uniform was the skirt. So because a girl was so small, four years, five years, six years, what difference it makes? But the next generation, if you go in Turkey today, no one knows how to wear a trouser. They took out the trouser. So he made a modern girl. That was clothing. He attacked the clothing. So remember, if you got a chance to wear this garb, hold on to it. Thereafter, he made a law that you can't say the word Allah. And it's something to think about. He gave a translation. You can only use this word. You can't use Allah. For what reason? When I saw that, I thought about the word God. That no one knows what his word meant. But he said it means God. But what's the difference? You say Allah. Allah is in all languages. Similarly, God, no one knows the translation of God. It is not a translation of any of the sifat of Allah. Rahman, Rahim, Al-Malik, Al-Quddus. You can use any of them, the sifat of Allah. But the name of Allah is one Allah. God, no one knows what it means. So to come on to this, always say Allah. Because there was some reason why he said Allah can't be used in Turkey. You must use this word God. So Allah came out. Then the Adhan, he said, why must you give it in the Arabic language where no one knows the meaning? Take it out. Change it into our language. And people are very happy. He even changed Salah into his language. But it never worked. So the Salah they kept in the Arabic, but the Adhan was changed. Then he said, the reading of Quran is banned. So the Makatib were closed and school started. When I met this man, I asked him, you can read Quran. He said, Mustafa Kamal, because of him, no one knows how to read Quran in our country. No one. Take it out. But one generation, he only had 10 years of rule. 10 to 15 years, 10 years when the time when he was, but he could do what he wanted. In 10 years, he raped the entire Turkey. 70,000 masajid. Every masjid's imam was removed and a government man was put in. So from the member, we will control the mind of Turkey. 
And where 70,000 it reached, I think the number is 70,000, not one masjid was allowed after that. The law was no more masjids in this country. So he stopped it. The point I wanted to mention was when I reached there to Turkey, I knew a Mustafa Kamal, I knew modern Turkey, I knew what Islam happened, so I was sad also. And the one thing that he knew is from the masjid, Noor spreads. So how do you prevent the spreading of Noor into the world? People are going to come to the masjid. He said, I will make the masjids into museums. So Europeans will walk in in filthy, dirty states, without clothing, and with their filth. Women are in their periods, and they walk through the masajid. As they walk through the masajid, this is called the highest level of desecrating the masajid. So he finished it. So when we reach the masjid that you normally will visit is what is called the blue, the blue masjid, the blue mosque, which is known as the mosque of Sultan Ahmed. They call it blue because of the light that comes in the masjid when the sun shines because of the rays of the windows, the panes of the windows. So when I came there, I saw all the buses. And the thought went to me that what he did to this country. So many Europeans, no trousers, no scarves, hands are open, walking in the masjid. So I was sad. But what I saw after that, it created such hope in me. And that's the points I wanted to mention. As soon as I walked, my mind went to one verse of Quran, where a Nabi of Allah, he walked past the masjid of Sulaiman salam after it was brought down to the ground. It stood for many years, then an evil king, Bukhta Nasr, came, and his soldiers from Iraq, they raised the entire masjid. And every copy of the Torah, they burnt it, and every scholar was either killed or taken as a slave to the lands of Iraq. So now there was no Islam left in Aqsa. So as that Nabi walked past, he looked at it and he said, How will Allah ever give life to this land again? Anna yuhyi hadhi al-ardu ba'da mawtiha. So Almighty Allah said, فَأَمَاتَهُ اللَّهَ مِئَةَ عَامٍ Day and day we told him, die. And he fell down dead for 100 years. 70 years after his statement, the people started coming back to the land of Aqsa. And started putting it up again. Hundred years after his statement, he was told, stand. When he stood, he said, civilization. Where did it come from? In hundred years, Allah Tawarukullah makes revolution. Mustafa Kamal, when he died, Islam was like dead. But Allah Tawarukullah made it. Now it has reached, I think, the year, about 90 or 80 years from his death. And when you enter Turkey today, you can see Islam is coming back into Turkey. And you wonder, on hundred years, Allah said, Amatahullah, hundred years give me and the whole thing will change. So when I walked and I saw, what a change in Turkey. That's why the topic was from Istanbul. When Sultan Muhammad took over Constantinople, they had to change the name. Because Constantinople was Constantine. They named the city Islambul. Bul means place, the road. Islam means Islam. The road of Islam, the place of Islam, the city of Islam. When Mustafa Kamal came, he couldn't stand the word Islam. So what changed? So he changed it is to Istanbul. Up till now they discuss what is the meaning of Istan. Some say it got no meaning. Some give some other meaning. Just to get away from Islam. But now again it's Istanbul back to Istanbul. And you see it. The time of Suleiman the Great was regarded as the greatest force that what we call recent history had ever seen, the countries that it was hitting, how he entered into Europe, how Europe was so scared Islam will take over the entire Europe. And Sultan Muhammad, we explained when he passed away, the day he passed away he was poisoned. The churches celebrated because they said this man was going to go through the entire Europe. He reached Venice. That's when he passed away. And that was like, but after that they rose, rose, rose. And then a time came when Allah Tabaruk Tala then as Nabi Sallallahu had predicted, a time will come when the whole thing will fall. So the Khilafat was destroyed. And they really thought Islam is finished. And then the whole Turkey was destroyed of Islam. Everything of Islam was removed. Quran was removed. Kurta was removed. Niqab was removed. Allah, the word Allah was never taken in Turkey. The masajid were made into museums. Not a single new masjid could be built. Turkey then became Istanbul, came everything but Islam. And Europeans in the dozens, in the dozens... When we flew into Istanbul, at that time they said that Istanbul at the moment in the world is the third most visited, visited city in the world. It has even gone more than what was New York. How many tourists come into this land? So when I entered, I obviously felt, and look at all this, the buses were there. There were so many lines and all these European women. 
and you see them going in the masjid. But when I entered the masjid, I different scene I saw, which gave a message that Islam never dies. But Islam comes alive in a manner that leaves you amazed also. So when I, what I will mention here, you put yourself in that picture, that you see yourself walking. I walked, now I saw the lines. They said, it's so many lines, I have to stand in what a line to get in the masjid. And long lines, and it's hot. And before we going there, my friend told me, you make sure you have shoes that are good for walking. Because only walking, only walking. So now we entered, we entered into the courtyard first. Before going in the courtyard, I just looked, your heart feels that you see that girl without any trouser, without any scarf, without any hand covering. She's like naked. And you see, she's going to enter the masjid. So then I saw one sign was written there, and this is the new government, and make a lot of dua for them. Allah, tawarukta, how he works. When I wrote a little bit about Turkey, I found that article, where one man wrote that Erdogan is now, but the group that brought about Erdogan, just a few years before this, when the president was trying to push some Islam into Turkey, little Islam, nothing much, the military of Turkey wrote a letter to him. So they put that letter. The letter was from the military of Turkey to the president. We warn you that Turkey will never forget the favors of Mustafa Kemal and we will never leave the legacy of Mustafa Kemal. What he did, we will keep. The president had to resign after that. He said, Erdogan then after came. But Allah Pak made this man do such kamal in Turkey that he has changed the entire thing. And the military is like helpless. And they are now changing. So what things made? And Allah does when He wants to do. As we reached there, there was a signboard. What a simple thing. That because this is the house of the Creator, it requires dress code. Whole world accepts dress code. You go to shop also, you can't go in your underwear. Dress code. So that European girl got no problem with the dress code. So there's one small room there, and that man who's there, and there's a woman in niqab also, she's also there. And she says, sister, sister, will you please wear this? Brother, will you wear this? My friend, will you wear this? Meaning you got shorts on, will you just put on this trouser? No problem. So I never really took note of it. I mean, you see a woman putting on this. She put on a cloak, she put on something, she put on something. But what made me take note... That as I walk past, now we don't, they just tell you, yeah, you carry on, because you dressed, you full in niqab. But as I walked, then I heard one European girl saying to her European friend, how I look. Because that's all they worry, how they look. So the other one said, fabulous. She said, take a picture of me, I must show my family. So I also looked to them, not to see the girl. But to see in one second a European girl became a Muslimah. And she herself is saying, I look wonderful. That one donning of that cloak took away all the lies of European propaganda that the cloak puts you backward in life. You should have seen how she was moving. She's looking like this and she's looking like that. And then my mind went to an tafsir of when the magicians came to combat Nabi Musa a.s., they also put on the clothes of Musa a.s., whether it was a joke for whatever purpose. And ulama wrote that Allah Taala blessed them with such iman after that. Some wrote the reason was they came in the guy, in the garb of the beloved of Allah. Almighty Allah said, I'll make the insights like him. Whatever it was, but when you see those Europeans putting on that niqab, not niqab, take week, they'll call it niqab, he says burqa. But her hand is covered and her legs are covered. So when I looked at that, I said, wow, that the very Mustafa Kamal who took out the trousers from the woman of Turkey, in his own plan, Almighty Allah put the trouser on the girl of Europe. His plan, he brought her into the masjid, where she would have found Islamic clothes in Europe. He brought her here to cover her legs. In that hot summer, she never covers legs. And when she covered it, she said, wow. I look fantastic. Islam at the moment in Europe is spreading at such a rate. I used to wonder what makes it spread. When I was in that small masjid, big masjid, but the whole world is so small. I said, how Allah does is unique. One one girl who returns takes a whole message of Islam back with her. Her mind is made as a Muslim. Her understanding, her dress, her pictures. First thing she said, wow. One friend sent a clip to me after the Paris attacks. 
the reporter says, she's taking interviews, that the churches are emptying and the masjids are being built in London, in England. France is even much more. She ends the report by saying, at the rate that it's moving at, in 10 years time, in the entire England, Islam will be the majority of religion. Imagine, meaning Christian got this number, this one got that number, this one. In religion, said Islam will be the highest if it moves on this rate. The rate is going faster. And this is England, France, and that is beyond. You wonder how, but as I told you, how many planes are coming into Istanbul? Daily you're getting thousands of tourists. Each tourist is putting on that cloak. She walks in the masjid. Now we entered the courtyard. Courtyard is huge, there's a lot of things to see. For us it's pictures, frames, we know it all, you don't bother. But because of that first thing, that day I started taking a lot of note of things. So the first frame that I went past, and the man who did it, may Allah reward him, what a mind. He gave such a dawah of Islam without saying one word. The first frame is a frame of what is called the tree of the world. Meaning Nabi Adam alayhi salam, Adam is on top. Who were the children of Adam, the main ones? Which Nabi came, which Nabi came, which Nabi? The highlight of it is what is called Yaqub alayhi salam because Bani Israel. And everything was the English name there. And Bani Israel and then who are the children? And then here you got Isa alayhi salam and here you got his mother Mary. What's mention of Mary in the Quran? What's mention of Isa alayhi salam in the Quran? Where they came from? They came from Ishaq. But Ishaq's brother is Ismail. And Ismail in his progeny, there is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are all brothers. So you got a tree, we knew it all. But that day when I saw one Christian man explaining to his Christian son what's happening on this tree. Because you have to explain. I said, amazing, he's giving dawah to his son. Whole world said, this is the deen of Muhammad, religion of Muhammad, who's Muhammad, evil Muhammad, no one knows. He's saying, yeah, Abraham, the father of all the faiths. Here's Moses here. Here's Jesus. Hey, Jesus is in the Quran. Here's Jesus. Amazing, you see that man taking a snap. Who is going to show that snap to of that whole thing, that whole paper? My phone never have the ability to get that thing, but he's got it. Who is going to show Dawat? We went on to the next one. For me, it was no big thing, but that day it was a major thing. The next frame was the frame of the Kaaba. And the Kaaba has its unique Dawat itself. But with those who see the Kaaba real, a picture just makes you say, Subhanallah, that's all. But when you see a non-Muslim looking at a picture of a Kaaba, you will understand what a magnet the picture itself got. So already it was written there, Abraham. He saw Abraham on the previous frame. Father of all the messengers. And now here is written that the Kaaba is not built by Muhammad. He says the first house built for the worship of the Lord was the one put up by Abraham. That's the verse of Quran. And then you got the Kaaba with that how many millions in sajda. To see that non-Muslim snapping that thing. Snapping that. What a sight. That the whole Kaaba went in his heart. And then as you move now, that man who put up those frames, as though he's like touching the pulse of the world, where the world says that women are oppressed in Islam. So he writes the final sermon of the messenger, the final messenger. Look after your woman, the rights of women. Look after your salah, the rights of women. You got that. And then because of war and terrorism. So he doesn't write, Islam says no to terrorism. He got nothing like that. He says in the messenger of the Almighty said, that if you ever have to go out in battle, do not cut the trees, do not harm the old, do not harm the young, do not touch the woman. That day. The person who reads that wonders now. All the blowing ups, all the bombs. He never said anything. He put one hadith. And all that story went. And then like that, there were a couple of frames. But to see those people reading those frames, one by one, see the lines and this reading, reading. And at the ending now, they have this room there. If you've got any questions of Islam, he even wrote it. If you're an atheist or you're a Christian, you're a Jew, you're an atheist, you're this, this, this. No matter who you are, if you've got any questions of Islam, feel free to ask. And many masjids now have it there. And when I walked past, I saw that you had that man sitting there, that man sitting there. The man I saw, he doesn't even look like man. Forget like a Muslim. With what long hair going on his body. But he was there sitting on the couch waiting to ask questions on Islam. You wonder who and where Allah is going to bring into Islam. So after that day, now we enter the masjid. That was the courtyard. During the salah time, masjid is not allowed for tourists except Muslims. But immediately after salah, you now allowed. So you see the whole crowd waiting, 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 waiting. And they enter. Never in their life 
Someone told them, one day you'll be dying to enter the masjid. You say, never, that day you see it. Because you're waiting, you, you never have to pay a ticket also. It's the only thing in Istanbul, it's free. So it's part of the tour, you'll go year, year, year. So you have to go and it's hot outside. So it's the day that they wait to enter. And when they enter, now they have at the back a place, they can't go further than that place. So the masjid doesn't get that desecrated with non-Muslims. They're at the back. At the back now, namaz just finished. So you definitely got someone performing his sunnah salah there. You have women at the back in the salah. For us, we just go past the woman and we move. But then we see these tourists, because they're more closer to the woman, the men are more in front. So they are looking at that woman who's in sajda. And he's taking a snap of that. Because that sajda has amazed him also. Now that posture which we grew up with, where your hands are like this, and you're going in ruku. And if you see a man here taking a picture of a woman in sajda, you think, are you mad or what? But for the non-Muslim, that picture is his dawah to Islam. That what a movement. And she goes in sajda. And that woman is in sajda. And he's just looking. Just see, they silent, silent. They're just looking. You don't know what's going in their mind. Now after the salah, amazing, Turkey was robbed of Quran. The new government, no one knows Quran in Turkey. So the new government made it after every salah in this blue masjid, what they call blue mosque. And many other masajid most likely. After every salah, the mu'azzin reads one ruku. Beautiful Quran. Now you can think if he's reading one ruku after every salah, in every day he's finishing quarter para. They're getting more Quran khatams than we ever make. So after the salah, where we're ready to jump out, because our normal habit is after salah gone, people sit. And so much of respect, although they got no deen, they never had it. When the adhan goes, you will see they quiet. As though it's haram to talk during adhan. So the one boy said something in front of me. So a South African boy. He said something to his father. The Turkey man just looked at him with eyes. That you dare talk when the adhan goes. That respect. So after salah with that same respect they sit. And you see that whole majma just sitting. And the muazzin starts reading Quran. One ruku. They also enjoying the Quran. But the Quran, who's listening to it at the back is all those Europeans. They also just standing and listening. One ruku of Quran, they get that dawat also. They've taken their snaps, they're taking off the qari, reading Quran. But when they leave, what an impression they leave word, who knows. That when they go out, Islam is spreading in the world. Each one of them, just from that one visit of Sultan Ahmad Masjid, when he comes out, he comes out with a completely different understanding of Islam. The cloak was unique, the covering was unique, the Kaaba was unique, Salah was unique, Quran was unique. And you see every one of them going out with a smile. No one like with hatred for Islam. So you wonder how the Dawah... So at that time as I walked out, I saw many other things in Turkey, but we're not going to mention. This itself is going to give you an example of the whole story. When I walked out, I smiled. And one sentence came to my lips. I never say it loudly. I just said that Mustafa Kamal... When the angel is smiting you in the grave, because kafir, I'm sure there will be times when the angel will say that I won't hit you, but let me give you a guzari of what's happening on top. That in whatever you did, Almighty Allah is using you now to spread Islam in Europe. Because all Europe is coming to your masjid, you call them, <laughs> and they're going back with your message. Islam, that itself is his adab. Islam never dies. Thereafter, we saw many things and I had so much of hope. Now I was in the hotel last few days. So one person who was also a helper at the hotel from Syria, because now in Turkey you only see Syrians. It's the only country helping the Syrians. And we know what's happening. I was there at the time when all the Syrians started flowing into Europe. What they called Europe opened the gates. And at that time we were all discussing that all the Syrians are going into Europe. Europe is going to make them all kafir. That's what they call them for. They call them. Now why are they closing the gates quickly? Now they're saying, we're not allowing, we're putting laws here, we're putting laws, we can't allow anymore. But they opened their arms first, why? They really thought, like how when they took them to South America, they made them all non-Muslim. They thought, same thing here. There will be no Muslims left in Syria. So that was in my mind, so I met this boy, 21 years old, but quite tall, very handsome. He got no beard, he got no, he doesn't look like what we will call like a pious boy, but he's a boy from Sham. So I was speaking to him, then he told me, you're Arab, you. I said, no, I'm not Arab, I'm from South Africa. He said, South Africa, you don't look like South African, because African means you have like black. 
I said, no, I'm from India. But he said, no, but you look Arab, you. I said, no, my clothes is Arab. My face is Indian, but you don't know Indian. He said, no, you are Arab. So because we learned the Arabic in Madrasa, and that's why we started speaking. So as I'm speaking to him, I told him, you know what? That how hard you married? So he said, no, very hard to get married. And he explained why. I said, but you go to the camps. There's so many girls in the camps. He said, yeah, but the Arab, even the girl in the camp, she wants the high meher. High meher. Even in the camp, she either no husband or high meher. They won't give. So I said, then how you manage without a wife? Because look at this country. Look at this woman who walk on the streets. So he said, I work in the hotel. And for years I'm working. He said, I carry their bags. And their hotels are not like our Hilton. Their hotels is one man runs the show. So at night he's the only one in the hotel at the lobby. Even the hotel door is locked. When you come there, you press the bag. He'll come, he'll open up for you. He'll say, welcome, welcome. Your room is ready. You take your bags. So he says, there are so many times when these girls come. And when I take the bags upstairs, then she even tells me, why are you going away? That you stay also. That I'm alone. So you stay for the night. He says, what stops me? He says, it's so hard. So I got shocked like, to hear that you're in the room. Nabi Yusuf Ali salam was like, in the room. So I told him, how you survive? So look at that answer he gave. He said, we the people of Sham, we don't do zina. And then he spoke for the whole Sham. But the sentence he said, we the people of Sham, we don't do zina. So I, I wanted to hug him on that. And I said that Europe doesn't know what's coming to them. They're bringing boys like that into Europe, where they think they're going to make these boys murtad. These boys are going to change the entire Europe. That's what's happening. When you take such boys into that land, they're not going to become kafir. All Europe is seeing Islam at the moment. So as I met him, then I thought when Hazrat Mehdi comes, Isa Ali Salam comes, after the wars, we know the whole European world will accept Islam. So I used to always wonder, that how, do, how will they accept Islam? The Arabs will all come on to Islam, the Muslims will come on. But a man who grew up in Christianity whole life, suddenly he accepts Islam, who's going to teach him? Because I know our people can't teach, we can only teach our own people. It's only an Arab who can teach anyone. An Arab is a man who can keep his class above the rest. And he can mix with everyone. We can't mix and we got no class. But the Arabs are never ever in the lands of Europe. So when he said that and I said, Wah, that Allah, Pak, how he is sending the Arabs to Europe? In the thousands. So a time will come where the whole Europe will be ready for Nabi Isa Whole Europe. Unique. So I met him and I wanted to hug him. That was like my last day in Turkey when I came out. I was in that aeroplane and I was reading the article that at the moment Turkey is the third most visited city in the world. I said that subhanallah, like one country. And I came back, I was reading, so one person wrote, he wrote, Erdogan's government. Because isn't the military said, we will never let Mustafa Kemal's law change. They said, Erdogan's government at the present moment, they made 15 changes to the education system. Such subtle changes that the military got no problem with it. They never introduced Quranic studies into the syllabus because it's too loud. Quran. But Erdogan said, you know, the old script of Turkey was never ever how we write, like English. English you write A, B, C. But you know Urdu. Urdu you write Alif, Bata. At one time in Turkey they used to write their language like that, in the Arabic script. Alif, Bata, until Mustafa Kemal came. So Erdogan said, it's our culture to know how to write our language. So he introduced in the school, you have to write your old script. So the man wrote, he never introduced Quranic studies. But by introducing the old script, he said the next entire generation of Turkey will know how to read Quran. Because you know that script. One change, he said 15 changes he brought. He said, in one generation, this man is going to change the entire Turkey. May Allah Tawarukullah make it. The whole world is changing. The world saw a modern world is not an Islamic world. The world, modern world is coming back to Islam. Istanbul is becoming back to Islambul. It mustn't happen that we already put on such a high level, we go down. May Allah Tawarukullah take us all upwards, upwards. Have azmat for our deen. It's a deen that never dies. No matter who try to break it, Islam says, I'll rise again. I'll go through Mustafa Kamal, I'll go through Khomeini, I'll go through America, I'll go through Britain, I'll go through Russia, 
way and way Islam went through and Islam will continue going. May Allah tabarak ta'ala bless us. We see with those eyes that Islam is just coming alive. The flags are rising. The whole world is changing. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbi. الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا قيمة للمتقين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه وبارك وسلم اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام تبارك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام سمعنا وأطعنا وفرانك ربنا وإليك المصير اللهم ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم بسم الله ما شاء الله لا قوة إلا بالله سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون